It's the world this week. The world this week in partnership with the Daily Beast. Joining us from the Nigerian capital, Abuja, Philip Obaji, Daily Beast a correspondent. How are things? Very well. Very well. It's good, good to join you. Good to see you. Good to see Anne Corpé, senior correspondent at sister station Radio France International, host of uh, the uh, daily show Décryptage, which is uh, basically a focus on every day on the topic of the day. Exactly. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Is, uh, is Vivian Wall, Paris correspondent for Time magazine, good? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh-oh, <laughs> we're getting a downgrade each time. How about Catherine Field, Europe correspondent for New Zealand media, NZME, who in a previous life was the Observer's correspondent in Hong Kong. Yeah, and covering China. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Four years of my life covering Jiang Zemin. All right. Well, we, we have questions about Jiang Zemin, who passed away this week. <laughs> Uh, later on. Uh, by the way, you can listen, like, and subscribe to The World This Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. First time since 1976, a French president in the Big Easy New Orleans, Emmanuel Macron, uh, visiting that former French colony that Napoleon sold, uh, part of a three-day state visit uh, to uh, the United States. There are not many people who speak uh, French or derivatives thereof, uh, Vivian Wald, these days. But the numbers are growing in uh, Louisiana. And, you know, this is, this is uh, for, for the French, there's an element of um, kinship, if you will, uh, with Louisiana. I guess so. I mean, when I first heard he was going to New Orleans, I thought, that's kind of a softball sort of thing. I mean, it's like uh, maybe to counterbalance all the heavy politics and tensions in Washington. Um, but there is something colorful. You know, there's certainly a French touch, uh, the French Quarter. You can eat some beignets. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's a, in some sense a, a sort of feel-good moment for Macron, which he could certainly use. Well, it's, to be fair, not just a feel-good moment. Uh, Lu uh, Louisiana is on the front lines of climate change. It's at sea level, uh, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, and that's something that's coming up, Catherine. Yeah, that's right. He's been really very heavy on climate change. This is his big issue, is climate change. And also we're looking at the, the redevelopment after Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. So all these things come together. But you, know, you have to remember he didn't initially plan to go there. The great plan initially was that he would go from Washington to Canberra, in Australia. And this was going to be the great love in tour. This was going to be, we've forgotten about the Orcus Rocus a, a year ago. Yeah, just when, when, when the US scuttled that submarine deal between France and Australia. Yeah, well, yes. And relations got to such a low that the then French ambassador to Washington was recalled to Paris. This was just a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so the great plan was that as part of Emmanuel Macron's opening up as being the great player in the Asia Pacific, he was going to go to Washington and then he was going to nip down to Canberra uh, to show that France is a great partner in the Asia Pacific. But the Australians didn't play ball because the Australians still won't buy those submarines. OK, so that's still up in the air. Now, Thursday, uh, uh, there was a bit of a love in the White House state dinner. Uh, uh, which uh, a first White House state dinner for the teetotaling Joe Biden. He's got ginger ale, I think, in that in that class. Uh, toasting his country's uh, uh, oldest ally, as he put it, Macron. Uh, now you might say an old hand at White House state dinners. Cue the images from 2018. So tonight I ask that we raise our glasses as I offer this toast to President Macron and Brigitte. Remember that, Anne Copé? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the state dinner... You were, you were the Washington correspondent. Of the yes, time. I was there at that time. By the way, when yeah. Macron came the first time, there was also a question of a, a trip to New Orleans, uh, but it didn't happen at the moment. And I must add that there's a French-speaking TV in New Orleans, Télé Louisiane. Yeah, and so w w this, this state dinner that we saw on Thursday... It, I mean, they're, they're like-minded leaders, aren't they? Emmanuel Macron, a centrist, uh, Joe Biden, a centrist Democrat, uh, both with a far right to contend with. Yes, yeah, the youngest ever French president and the oldest ever American president <laughs> made a show of unity with my dear uh, Joe, my friend Emmanuel, and 
It was really a show of being together, being uh, reunited uh, more than a year so after this terrible uh, submarine story. So having covered more than one, do state visits matter? Yes, they do. They do. It's, it's a big show and there's no announcement, no, but it's, it's people get together. It's not only the president, it's also all the teams that get in touch, uh, many ministers, uh, people from a uh, lot of companies came also with Macron to try to make deals in the US. And so it's, it's important to have real contact, especially with, uh, after this COVID pandemic time where people didn't meet too, too much. And uh, especially after the submarine terrible story, there was a need to resynchronize, as Macron said all the time. Uh, so it was a big show of unity about Ukraine, and despite the disagreement on uh, trade, especially. Yeah, F Philip Obagi, it's a reshoring of old uh, alliances here, and with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the U.S. and France, both nuclear powers, uh, they uh, have a need to work more in lockstep. How is that viewed from where you are? Well, everyone remembers what happened before Russia, in fact, indeed uh, invaded Ukraine. We saw the effort, you know, that Emmanuel Macron did put to try to convince Vladimir Putin that that wasn't the best option. So yes, the visit of the France president to to Washington did you know create a lot of interest uh, here in Africa because people wanted to you know people are looking forward to finding out what these two leaders will talk about, especially as it has to do with maybe Putin pressure uh, yet again on Vladimir Putin as far as his invasion of Ukraine is concerned. But again, it is important that we get to know exactly. You know what's new from the U.S. angle, and also what you know um, President Macron will be bringing to the table in terms of conversations as to what actions to take, whether it's renewed sanctions on Russia or whether it's to apply much more pressure, you know, on Vladimir Putin. But it is one visit that everybody in Africa, people in Europe, are already keeping a close eye on. Oh. Yeah, he answered a reporter's question in English, Vivian Walt, uh, because there there is this lingering perception that Emmanuel Macron is soft on Russia, and uh, he was very unambiguous and pointedly responding in English on that, saying it's Kiev that gives that takes the lead when it comes to time for suing for peace. Absolutely, and I think especially among Americans, there is you know of course the lingering. Um, feeling about France being basically soft on war. Um, you know, the Americans still haven't quite gotten over the fact that the French did not join the coalition that went into Iraq 20 years ago. Um, and so um, definitely there there is that. And the other thing is you have France, well, in, in this case, France emblematic emblematic of the EU, being caught between the U.S. and China, and um, and the, and the whole tension of the subsidies and the semiconductors um, is very much to do with that. Which way is Europe's loyalty is going to swing? There is a lot of uneasiness on this continent. Every time there's a major war, there's the feeling that. America comes out stronger and Europe weaker. At least that's a perception uh, that a lot of people have been floating the last couple of weeks. When they look at the fine print of uh, what's called in America the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, but is in fact an energy stimulus bill, uh, Macron seemed to score a win for Europe, the U.S. promising uh, to study how its $369 billion uh, bill can accommodate European businesses is going to be some kind of a task force. And we even heard uh, the U.S. president admit to, quote, glitches when it came to that legislation. It was never intended when I wrote the legislation, never intended to exclude uh, folks who were cooperating with us. That was not the intention. The intention was to make sure we no longer in a position when there was a pandemic in Asia and China decided they're going to no longer sell us computer chips. Uh, we invented the damn things. 
Um, you know, so it's anyway, but my point is we're back in business. Europe is back in business and we're going to continue to create manufacturing jobs in America, but not at the expense of Europe. Uh, Catherine Field, let's take a listen before I, I turn to you on uh, to Macron's response, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, maybe because he didn't want to offend his host or maybe because he believes it, uh, saying uh, uh, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, up to the United States on this one to raise its game. It's up to Europe. Sur les semi-conducteurs, l'hydrogène. On semiconductors, hydrogen, batteries, our industry will continue to move forward as Europeans. And we are not here to ask for proof of love. We are here to agree on a strategy and to clarify things that need to be clarified. Now that the talk is done, we have our own work to do. We can't ask the United States of America to pass a law to solve Europe's problems. So in Europe, we must go faster and stronger to have the same ambition and succeed in being synchronized. What's your reaction to that, Catherine? Oh, he's talking to people back in France. Yeah, he's saying, I'm here, I'm beating the drum, I'm going to get some sort of leverage over the Americans so as we can you know, get a better deal when this Inflation Reduction Act uh, comes in. I, I just assume that's what he was doing because that, you know, don't forget when he went to America, uh, he had a plane full of businessmen, a plane full of investors, and that's what they wanted to hear. Um, you know, he, he's... It's a difficult job for him because you know, America does have this enormous industry. It does need to be propped up. Did he succeed, though? Because, you you know, by the minute there's glitches, we'll have a task force, we'll sit down. Yeah, you could almost think that this is something of a, all right, you know, we've said the right things, let's just you know, move along, nothing more to see here, sort of thing. You agree, Anne Corbett? Yeah, I think it's also a message to Europe. Macron will maybe wants to build a bi-European bi act. Right. Yeah. So... That could be the beginning of a kind of a trade, was, trade war be, between talking Europe not only and to the America. French but also to Brussels. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, pushing Europe to do what basically Macron has been talking about for five years, um, which is European sovereignty, boosting, you know, uh, European economic fiscal unity, etc. And he's really come up short, and and this is he's come up short. In some ways, yes, as I think as evidenced by this by the fact that the US is way ahead on this. I mean both both, you know, zones are being utterly protectionist and so are the Chinese and but the, the Americans are are just better at it. They you know as somebody I interviewed today said to me, the problem is Biden runs a country and Macron does not run Europe. And therefore there's like they're not on the same level in terms of being able to get done what they want to get done. Yes, but with Angela Merkel gone and UKIP running through prime ministers like Kleenex, Macron seems to be, you know, the spokesman for Europe now. He he, he wants to appear as a, the the main leader in Europe, and I think Biden offered him this status. And if I can. Go back to Ukraine just to say that it was very interesting to see Joe Biden's Joe Biden willingness of opening a line of communication with Vladimir Putin with condition. But he said he may talk to the Russian president, which he hasn't done for months. I guess he had only three conversations with Vladimir Putin since the beginning of the war. So this is also... This is not for now, of course, but he came uh, closer to Macron on this topic particularly. I, I, I want to raise one more point. I uh, want to get back to, to Ukraine because we're not, we're not finished with it. There's a lot more to be said, particularly how it concerns the rest of the world. Uh, first, though, uh, uh, the, there is uh, this feeling that uh, when it comes to defense, uh, Europe relies on the U.S. When it comes to uh, trade... It's more of a tussle. And in fact, a lot of American eyes are looking hopefully towards Europe or to regulating tech. It's been another tumultuous week at Twitter. Uh, the, the new boss rolling back content moderation. And we saw uh, this meeting that took place. Uh, Thierry Breton, the internal markets commissioner, even tweeted about it. A meeting with uh, Elon Musk. And in that meeting, 
uh, he he stated uh, that uh, there is uh, a lot still uh, to be done, uh, uh, huge work ahead still. Twitter will have to implement transparent user policy, significantly reinforce content moderation, and tackle disinformation. Uh, uh, you just heard Catherine Field say how uh, when it comes to trade, uh, the U.S. Uh, is ahead. When it comes to reining in the power of big tech, is it also the case? Absolutely. And by the way, you know, Thierry Breton just pulled out of this meeting that they're having um, outside of Washington. Um, next week. Next week. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's not just um, a matter of content moderation. It's also all sorts of other things. And I think that Breton has really kind of displayed his irritation about it. You know, the layoffs that uh, Twitter, that Elon Musk did um, at the beginning of, of November, um, in which he fired like half the staff by email and including dozens and dozens of people around Europe and Africa, the entire Africa staff. Um, and I actually spoke to some of the lawyers and um, the the language they said was, you know, particularly insulting. And I think that's what has got under people's skin, that they are, in a sense, tired of feeling like, um, you know, the big tech giants of America um, treat the rest of the world as if they're just going to fall in line. Philip Obagi, you agree? That's right. Um, well, what I think a lot of people are so concerned about, not just in Europe, but also in Africa, is what will be of um, Twitter. Now we're seeing massive job cuts and the concern that when, you don't, when you're understaffed, you will have one big problem, especially when it has to do with fighting you know, disinformation. And we we'll see how um, Russian trolls, for example, have been using you know, social media, even Twitter, you know, to you know, spread this information in quite a number of countries. So I do, I do know that Europe is concerned also about you know job cuts and how you know Twitter will be able not just you know to moderate content, but also to fight this information. And that's the worry, you know, not just in Europe. But yeah, and and, and and Philip um, uh, Emmanuel Macron next the, later this month. Uh, he's going to be hosting a conference uh, in Paris for uh, investing in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Joe oh. Biden will be hosting a U.S.-Africa summit. They are calling out uh, at that Thursday press conference Russia's blame shifting over oil and food exports to the continent. Uh, you wrote a piece for the Daily Beast reporting on Wagner mercenaries recruiting jailed rebels uh, from the Central African uh, Republic and sending, uh, sending them off to fight elsewhere. Uh, sometimes with tragic endings, uh, uh, you, you write in the you quote one official saying, "No one can stop the Russians when they come into those jails because the government has given them so much power to act." Uh, you mentioned a Zambian student uh, jailed in Russia for uh, a, a drug offense and who wound up dead in Ukraine. That's true. Well, we're seeing a lot of activity in the Central African Republic as far as you know conscription into the Wagner group is concerned. Um, yes, you're correct, uh, Francois. I did write that quite a number of former rebels, you know, have been recruited to the Wagner group. And some of them, I'm told, have been sent to fight in Ukraine. And that's not, it's not just that. There are also Africans in Russia. You know, I did hear from a couple of um, students in Russian universities who told me that um, they were being pressured by school authorities, you know, to either join the, the Russian military or the Wagner group in fighting in Ukraine. So it's, it's worrisome what we're seeing right now, and they're not going to stop. Only recently we're told that um, there was an attack on a Wagner base. So if anyone was killed, which that's not what we're hearing that has happened, it means that Wagner will be looking at, you know, filling some of those gaps. But it's a big issue. and. Um, we just will wait and see what happens going forward. But something so, has to, to stop this, you know, regular construction from vulnerable countries in Africa. Yeah, and, and to pick up on, on, on Vivian's point about uh, being fed up with disinformation, and Corpe, Radio France International, like France 24 right now, uh, banned in Mali, off air, 
uh, the Malian government, which has sided with Russia, which is employing those Wagner mercenaries. So the narrative a lot of people are getting uh, in West Africa uh, is thanks to outlets like Twitter. Yeah, yeah, Twitter. Uh, some researcher did uh, uh, research about the tweet since Elon Musk took uh, the power uh, in the company, and the head speech have increased a lot. Uh, alongside the disinformation. And of course, uh, in the countries where Russian medias or Russian people are, uh, this is a, the Russian message goes to the minds, of course, yes. Well, speaking of getting messages across, uh, the uh, protests in China didn't last long last weekend, but still the biggest in decades, and they seem to have left their marks fed up with nearly four years of repeated COVID lockdowns. And with censorship, many displaying, as you can see, blank sheets of paper to denounce uh, what was going on. Also, at times, as we saw in Beijing over the weekend, playing the sarcasm card. Yeah, they're, they're chanting, I want a COVID test, Catherine Field. Yes, that wasn't the only thing they were chanting. They were also chanting things like, uh, give me a banana skin. Of course, the banana skin would be for Xi to fall over and lose power, yeah. Always using euphemisms. Uh, the, uh, 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 there was this one scene uh, when uh, one person tried to convince him of the opposite, to, to saying uh, there are anti-Chinese forces that surround us. And one person replied, who are these foreign forces, uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a long tradition of humor and, and sort of sarcasm in Chinese humor. But it, it was a very interesting rally because in other times, a couple of people were shouting you down with Xi. And then you got a whole group of the crowd, particularly in Beijing, who said, no, don't say that. Don't say that. We don't want to give them any more excuses than they're going to come up with for clamping down on this. So, yeah, it's been an, an interesting couple of days. Um, I'm not sure we're going to see it again, given that the authorities have clamped down on it so, so dramatically um, in a way that we're not even seeing nowadays. They've clamped down, uh, but they seem to have worked uh, to a degree in the sense that, well, We'll see, uh, Vivian Walt, uh, whether or not Xi Jinping follows up on it. He's announcing that the, there is perhaps an end in sight to uh, zero COVID policies. Well, yes, but the, perhaps an end in sight to zero COVID policies, but it won't look like it does to us in Paris, I doubt. Um, there's still, as far as I know, there is still going to be tremendous um, monitoring. Um, and... Also, what's been left after two and a half years of zero COVID policies is an unbelievable apparatus of surveillance and tracking and facial recognition and phone tracking and just an entire machinery, which was, of course, already and there, yet people, but ramped people turned up out, tremendously. Yet people turned out in the streets. Very, very brave people and desperate people, really. I mean, people were absolutely at the end of their tether. All right, the loosening of lockdown rules has uh, rich Chinese buying up ventilators and oxygen machines. Not everyone uh, welcoming uh, the, the, this uh, change, perhaps, that's coming. Uh, as the number of cases have soared in the face of uh, the highly contagious Omicron variant. It's interesting, Ancorpe, when you look at this, at the, at this graph and uh, how uh, it has uh, actually... Uh, we saw at the beginning of the, the pandemic, back in 2020, uh, lots of cases. And then uh, the numbers suddenly soaring between this, this chart, bringing together both the asymptomatic and the symptomatic cases uh, just of late. So while we have a surge here in France right now, we have a surge. There. Nobody's wearing their mask. At least I didn't see anybody on the, on, on the metro this morning, maybe one or two, but that was it. Uh, but in China, what is new looks, yeah. is that for the first time in the public discourse, they're talking about the low severity of Omicron compared to the previous various strains. And because uh, lowering the restriction is coming 
in opposite with everything they are saying, the surge, the danger of the disease. So people, some people are afraid, very afraid of COVID. And now uh, they don't understand why uh, those, uh, there is those, uh, easy, easy, why they are easing the restrictions. Mm. And the fact is, but Catherine will know better than me, that the, the state of the health system is not good enough uh, to face uh, hundreds of thousands of people in hospitals. Yeah, no, the, the health system is all but virtually non-existent unless you have hard currency and you can go to a special hospital. It's interesting what you said, Viv, about how people are, are tired. We've heard a lot in the last couple of days about is this like 1989 when there was pro-democracy. It's not. It's really much more like 1976 when there was... It was at the end of the Cultural Revolution when people were just tired. They were tired of Mao and all these new things happening. There were all these efforts to regenerate the revolution. And people came out on the street then in April of 1976 just because, like now, they were just so tired. All they wanted to do with their lives was go to a hutong, sit down, have tea with their granny, uh, go and meet a chum in the park for, to go and chat, go for a walk. And I see that. That's what's really interesting is that... Everyone is tired. It's been, can we go out? Can't we go out? The surveillance where you have on your phone, everything is on your phone. It has your health pass. It tells the authorities when you left your building. It tells the authorities which metro you got, what time, when you got off. It's really very sinister. So I think people are very, very fed up, tired with all this. Um, and this is why you've had such a nationwide outpouring which is unusual in China, that it's very unusual that you get a city like Shanghai, which is sort of well-educated, very Western, coming out in sympathy with something that's happening in Rumshi, because they recognise that that fire in Rumshi, in which at least 10 people died because it was under lockdown, COVID, that could happen to them. So there's a lot going on. Um, but And the only thing the regime could do was to slightly loosen it, you know, the party... Uh, is able to deal with any problem. That's the word that goes out. The Chinese Communist Party, there might be a problem, but they're the ones who can solve it. And by loosening the, the levers of power, letting everyone go, then that's fine. Because at the beginning of the week, we thought there were many people on this very set predicting, oh, no, Xi Jinping can't back down because that would be perceived as a sign of weakness. Although he is, sounds like he is, at least he's, he's paying lip service to loosening law. Yeah, he's loosening it. But what you don't see are all the people who are being visited at home, mm -hmm. that they're tracking, the police are tracking them on their phones. They're going to their homes. They're saying, we saw you at the demonstration. Don't go to any more demonstrations or you'll lose your job. We're also seeing, and I know of several instances of this, where they are phoning Chinese students abroad and saying, can you take that video off that, off your social media stream? Uh, because it's, you know, it's offending the motherland. And there was one particular case, I know personally, of a Chinese student in Australia who was phoned by the Public Security Bureau in Beijing and told, you know, you've got 2,000 followers on your social media, take that video off, it's harming the motherland. And she said, well, I don't know. And they said, oh, well, we just happen to have your father on the phone as well. And what do you think your father's going to say? And her father, of course, was scared. Her father said, please, just take it off. I just want a quiet life. And so these are all the measures that they're doing that we don't see. Uh, all we see are these very Orwellian figures on TV of white hazmat-suited policemen going through the street, which is just unbelievable. And Orwellian is probably a kind word for these types of scenes that we have. We saw Western leaders uh, calling out uh, the, the heavy hand of uh, Beijing this week. Uh, authorities in the Chinese capital uh, replying to the United States' criticism with a simple message, don't lecture us on COVID. The U.S. has a lot of domestic problems. It has adopted a policy of laxity regarding COVID-19. The U.S. leads the world in both COVID-19 infections and deaths. The U.S. is in no position to criticize China's epidemic prevention and control efforts. Point taken, Vivian Wall? Well, in some ways, he, of course, has a point in the sense that there are one million people in the U.S., <clears throat> excuse me, who have died of COVID, many of whom 
died needlessly because they were living in states that were, you know, very anti-vaccine and so on. Um, you know, it became very politicized. Um, however, what, you know, what China doesn't say in all of this is that these are much bigger issues than just COVID. I mean, the China, China's zero COVID policy has had a real dramatic effect on the global economy. And, um, and that, you know, that for the world, it's sort of urgent that they change tack and, um, and actually sort of admit some of their failings and try another strategy. Philip Obaji, where you are in Nigeria, what's China's star power these days? Well, I think what, what a lot of people are worried about, you know, with this whole zero COVID policy is the fact that Africa does a lot of trade with China, you know, and the lockdowns is making it very difficult for lots of businessmen and women to go over to China and do the usual trade. Nigeria, for example, imports quite so much from China. I don't think that there's any other country where Nigeria has got, you know, more, more, more trade with mm. than China. So it's worrisome, you know, for many Africans. And it's not just Nigeria trading with China in large volumes, but a lot of, quite a number of African uh, countries, the majority of African countries uh, in that situation. So, um, yeah, I wasn't expecting, you know, China to have any different response from the U.S. than what they say that America has to, you know, look at its own issues. So it's what we've been hearing, you know, from the Chinese government each time, you know, criticism comes from a Western nation. But, yeah, the entire world is feeling, you know, the impact of this whole zero COVID policy. And I think it's high time that the Chinese, you know, begin, you know, to do something that makes more sense in terms of easing this whole, you know, zero COVID, COVID thing. And the protests, by the way, uh, followed the death of this week of a former uh, Chinese president, Jiang Zemin, uh, too frail to attend the recent party congress that lifted uh, term limits for Xi Jinping. These are archive images. Uh, the 96-year-old Jiang's reign as party boss began just before the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown and continued through a period of, so of uh, soaring growth, booming trade with the West. In Hong Kong, whose handover from Brittany oversaw in 1997, citizens this Friday writing messages of condolences. Zhang, who is very, very different from Xi, like the time in the year 2000 when he called out the question of a Hong Kong journalist. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> got it or not, he says in Cantonese. Our, our former Hong Kong correspondent says he actually got uh, a lot of sympathy for speaking Cantonese in that outburst. Yeah, yeah, because very few um, huh. mainland Chinese speak Cantonese. So, yeah, I, he was certainly unique in that respect, the way he would sometimes deal with journalists. And then sometimes, of course, he used to have a We Party Act where he'd sing Elvis songs. Right. So, yeah, there were these two sides of him, which was that side. And then, of course, the other side of him, which was he cracked down enormously. Yes, whilst he did loosen up the economy, he created what then followed, which was enormous corruption because he sold off state enterprises to party officials, party bureaucrats, loyalists that then created the corruption that she is now rolling back on. Uh, yeah, he will be remembered also for being dreadfully harsh on any type of dissent, whether it be particularly um, human rights related to labour rights. We tend to remember the fact that under him he managed to get the 2008 Olympics to come to Beijing, he opened up the economy. But less is well known is the fact that you know, the Laogai system, the work camp, prison camp system was really operating as a complete separate entity from the rest of the state. And it was him who, who set that up, that allowed the army to operate these 
almost Thatcherite like cells mm. where they had the prison self financing. So they were, you had the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, owning hotels. They were exporting some of the produce from the prison camp. So he'll be remembered for that. So you, know, it's unlikely we'll see the same sort of outpouring of affection that we saw, say, for example, 1976 when Chou Enlai died, or after Hu Yaobang died in 1989 with the precursor to the Tiananmen uh, demonstrations. But you know, yeah, he, uh, he um, he'll have a mixed uh, review next week when when they have the official sending off ceremony for him. All right, there'll be there'll be pluses uh, and and minuses uh, there. Uh, speaking of pluses and minuses, the World Cup is now into its third weekend, and it's still dogged by politics. <laughs> Qatari force is using a heavy hand after Iran's elimination at the hands of the United States on Tuesday. This as Iranians continued to show solidarity with those defying the regime back home. He, he had a shirt on his hand with a slogan of woman life freedom and then he chanted woman life freedom which the security or police or whatever you call them. We have same issue in Iran. They can't even let people have the basic right or express themselves. And Corpé, uh, the, the, the incidents that took place at Tuesday's match come after uh, there was this um, hackers group that leaked that uh, there were there was communication between the Qatari forces and Iran's Basiji militia. Oh, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but what I uh, was amazed at is to see the crowd uh, going down into the street in Tehran celebrating uh, the defeat of the national team in, in, in Qatar. Uh, the team was seen as representing the regime, so people were happy that it lost their, their match. And uh, apparently there's a man who was killed in northern uh, Iran uh, for celebrating for the loss, uh, the loss of the football match. And uh, this guy who died was a friend of one of the players who did send his condolences on Instagram because they were together at school or something like that. So we remember that for the first match, first match the, um, the Iranian team didn't sing the national anthem, which was perceived as a sign of a... Um, resistance. Resistance or solidarity with the protesters. But then for the two other matches, they had to sing or they sing. Uh, I suppose, yeah. under high pressure, but it was uh, seen as a betrayal uh, by the protesters. Yeah, the protesters back back, back inside of Iran. Uh, those security forces on the night also bothered France 24's crew, despite our Simon Harding clearly displaying his accreditation. My daughter is We are okay. Why is there? No, no, we're doing our job. We're doing our job. No, no, no. We're doing our job. Hey, 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 one next to the other, that all this talk about human rights is an obsession of, uh, of people in the West, but, uh, uh, but, but mostly it's gone fine. Vivian Walt, your, your thoughts, though, do you think the Qataris might have a little bit of buyer's remorse now when they see that it's, again, we're heading to the third weekend and we're still talking politics? Uh in brief, yes, I do think so. Um, I actually was in Qatar um, a few years ago and was shown into these incredible rooms that they had taken all the FIFA officials in and shown the kind of wraparound screens and this extraordinary sort of fantasy land that they were going to build um, for the World Cup, which ultimately they did build at a really steep human cost. Um, and now comes the political cost. Um, yes, I think it's probably done, you know, tremendous sort of temporary good for tourism in the region. It's not just Qatar, but you have these hourly shuttle flights from 
Dubai and, you know, the Saudis are now bidding on the 2030 World Cup and so on. But I think that within Qatar, there is a lot of questions about was it worth spending 200 billion? Um, I do hear that among deal makers, business people who are in and out of Qatar all the time, um, business has been slowed down quite a bit. You know, contracts are being delayed um, because they've spent a chunk of change, even for the Qataris, right at the time that they're expanding their gas fields, they're, they're doing all these other major projects in the country. Um, so it has got to be worth it um, for them. And I think the spotlight has been very difficult and very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Catherine Field? You're asking the wrong person because I went completely into the sports part of it this week. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. I was just as, did, as did many people in the newsroom, by the way. Yeah, I mean the Ghana Uruguay. This just goes to show how memory oh. matters so much. The fact that this match was a grudge match from a match back in 2010, where Luis Suarez plays volleyball but, to stop a goal yeah, from Ghana. Yeah, and then smirked when they were going. And then, of course, just the day before, we had the Japan-Spain match where was the ball out, wasn't it out? And I was thinking, wow, this is going to be really good. And then everyone started talking about 1966, Jeff Hurst, same goal. But they didn't have you know, VAR in those days. And so it's been good to be reminded that it, it actually is a game, uh, but memories count and grudges are grudges, even if it's Suarez. Yeah, and, and uh, history repeats itself, but in a cruel fashion, Philip Obagi, for the for the Black Stars, what with uh, an, uh, an Andre Ayew penalty saved and then Uruguay winning in the end. What's the feeling where you are? <laughs> well, it's this feeling of sadness everywhere. I mean, Africans want to see African teams progress, advance into the knockout stages. Uh, yeah, yes, it's some people will say, well, it's um, split revenge in one way because Uruguay did not advance into the second round. But, you know, who cares about what happens to Uruguay if Ghana is not going to make it to the knockout stages? So it, a lot of people are sad, as expected. It's so painful, you know, if you look at the fact that Ghana perhaps should have got, gotten ahead. And if Andrea Yu had scored the penalty, maybe the story would have been different. But um, not many people love what they saw. You know, Ghana really, really should have made it into the economy. Maybe I'm a bit bad. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And just, just very briefly, uh, Philip, going forward, do Africa's hopes lie with, with Morocco or with Senegal? Well, more or less Morocco, yes. I mean, they, they, they have not lost yet. You know, they've, they came out from a very, very difficult group where you had Belgium, you had Croatia, and they still came up, came out on top, and which is something huge. Senegal, well, we have a difficult going forward, but um, we're looking at what Morocco can offer us. Okay, well, we shall see uh, <laughs> I I indeed. And Corpe, a, a quick prediction. Uh, football, no. I pass the bell to Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I go back to the locker room. <laughs> Vivian? I've been glued to the matches, but from the yeah. comfort of my it's, living room. It's a guilty <laughs> pleasure or not? Oh, yeah. It's been total drama and suspense. It's been great. <laughs> OK. Well, there we are. We're all conflicted. Uh, Vivian <laughs> Walt, many thanks, Catherine Field. And Gopi, Philip Obaji Jr., who is in Abuja. Thank you for being with us here in the world this week.